Good afternoon. Um, welcome to all of you for this uh, inaugural SOA Central Banking Lecture. It's really a pleasure and an honor to uh, welcome Professor Jose Antonio Campo uh, today and also Professor uh, Stanley Griffith Jones. Just a few, so I'm, I'm Uli Foltz, I'm the head of the economics department here at SOAS. And uh, just some housekeeping first. Uh, the lecture will be video recorded. So by being here, you are agreeing to be potentially recorded. So don't sue us afterwards. Um, and also, of course, please put your mobiles on silence. So we've set up this uh, SOAS central banking lecture um, to provide a forum for discussing uh, important issues relating to central banking and international monetary policy uh, with distinguished uh, scholars and practitioners. And uh, I could have thought of anyone better suited to kick off this series than uh, Jose Antonio. Jose Antonio has been uh, a very distinguished scholar, uh, publishing an awful lot of highly relevant uh, uh, books and papers on uh, the era of central banking and international monetary system. Uh, but he's also been a practitioner. He has a very distinguished record in his uh, home country in Colombia, where he served as Minister of Finance, uh, Minister of Agriculture, and Director of the National Planning Office. And he is currently also uh, serving at uh, the central bank. Um, so he does not only bring in uh, with him uh, scholarly insights, but also uh, insights from uh, his work in national government. But even more, he's also had a very distinguished career uh, with the United Nations, um, serving as uh, UN Under Secretary General uh, for Economic and Social Affairs, and also as Executive Director a secretary of the UN Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And so he has a truly internationalist perspective, uh, which of course also resonates well with our work here at SOAS, because uh, as you know, SOAS uh, works on uh, the different regions of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, but also uh, dealing with global uh, challenges. So I'm very, very delighted that Jose Antonio is uh, here with us today uh, to deliver this first uh, SOA central banking lecture. And uh, the plan is as follows. Uh, I will finish in a minute, then Jose Antonio will deliver the lecture. And then uh, we'll have uh, comments by uh, Stephanie, um, who actually I should also introduce briefly, even though she doesn't really need introduction. Um, so she's currently, currently the Financial Markets Director at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. Um, and uh, also uh, she's worked as a professorial fellow at uh, the IDS in Sussex. And I would have to spend another five minutes going through uh, all her achievements, so I'll, I'll not do that now. Uh, but I'll turn the floor to Jose Antonio and I'm looking very much forward to your lecture and your insights, and then we'll have some comments from Stephanie and myself, and then, of course, we'll open up, and uh, you're all welcome uh, to share your views and, and ask questions. Thank you. And let's all welcome Jose Antonio. Well, uh, let me uh, thanks uh, SOAS and Ulrich in particular for this uh, invitation to deliver this lecture. Um, uh, uh, this is part of a book which, uh, as I'll show it later, is actually one of the um, greatest advantages that is fr uh, you can download it freely. <laughs> so it's a free book. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, let me say th this, was the, this is the result of many years of research. Uh, that I do, I, uh, as I do, uh, I present in the introduction, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, very much like what Ulrich said. Uh, uh, I had a contacts with the IMF in different characters, 
Uh, first of all, I was a minister of finance, so I was in the state governor <laughs> of the fund, but the, uh, and, and so I, ha I built a personal relation with uh, some of the managing directors. Uh, but on top of that, um, uh, I, uh, when I was in the United Nations, I represented the United Nations in the International Monetary and Financial Committee. Uh, and, um, and then later on, I, I was involved in uh, at least two, two uh, tasks that the IMF uh, requested from me I, as chair of the, uh, of the group that uh, evaluated the independent evaluation office of the IMF, which actually is a very interesting uh, uh, evaluation office, probably one of the best in, uh, in the world. Uh, it produces really top uh, analysis of IMF issues. Um, uh, and I was also a member of the uh, of a group that uh, uh, analyzed the the role of the special drone rights, uh, which is a topic uh, I'm very fond of. So, so this is the the connection. And I, I also uh, let me underscore uh, perhaps uh, uh, one uh, little thing uh, about the book. Uh, uh, I had uh, as my dissertation advisor at Yale University, Carlos Diaz Alejandro. You may. Have, some of you have heard of him. Anyway, uh, he, he taught me that anything that you want to do, uh, analyze in economics has to be looked through the lens of history. Uh, so, uh, because he was also a very good economic historian. Uh, so I think one of the uh, good things about my book is that every topic I analyze has a history. Uh, and, uh, so be it the... Uh, the special drawing rights or international monetary cooperation of uh, capital account management issues, etc. So it's a, it, it, each one has the history uh, behind the uh, uh, the uh, what the IMF has today, uh, and perhaps for that reason, because I'm very conscious of history, I uh, actually chose uh, uh, the word non-system to refer to the international monetary non-system, uh, which is a, a for those of you who know the history of this, it was a typical term uh, used in the 1970s after the breakdown of the Bretton Woods arrangement. Uh, and the, the fact that they, you know, after the failed negotiations to design the Bretton Woods II, let's say second Bretton Woods, uh, everyone referred to this as a non-system because everything that happened afterwards was ad hoc. Let's say nobody designed it. Uh, and some of the, actually some of the major developments uh, were against the interests of some of the major players. Uh, for example, in floating exchange rates, uh, uh, floating exchange rate was not desired by any member country, uh, neither the U.S. nor the Europeans. Uh, and actually, uh, but it ended up being the, uh, this, you know, one of the central features of the non-system that we have today. So, the, so the, I use the word non-system, uh, which was a, a bit of a discussion with Oxford University Press when the book was being published. <laughs> Uh, because say, what, what the hell is this non <laughs> in, the, in the title? Anyway, and, uh, and of course, uh, being a developing country economy, uh, there is a lot of emphasis in the book uh, on developing, uh, developing country issues. I say. So it's, it's a bit of a perspective uh, of the system um, uh, from the view of the, of the developing countries. So let me start by, by you know, the, the four major issues of reform. Uh, uh, that I, I propose in the book, uh, which is the, uh, the the essence, in a sense, of uh, uh, of the background of the of the book. Uh, the first one uh, is the, the the need to uh, to have a, a better global reserve system. The global reserve system, of course, refers uh, to the uh, international money. Uh, so the uh, so we have a, a reserve system, which is essentially dollar based. Uh, uh, with, of course, the, uh, the euro and some other currencies, including the British pound, playing a secondary or tertiary role in the system. Uh, so the, the question is, what I where are the alternatives to reform the system, uh, in a sense, to, uh, uh, to create a, a system that is considered as uh, more fair or fairer, let's say, for all parties? The second is the issue of macroeconomic uh, policy cooperation. Uh, uh, which, of course, is uh, you know, high, you know, strongly related to the issue of the exchange rate system, uh, uh, because uh, the exchange rates uh, are supposed to be, since Bretton Woods, actually one of the adjusting mechanisms uh, uh, for global imbalances, let's say. 
The third is the issue of uh, prevention and management of crisis, uh, in which I deal with three different issues. The, the issue of capital account uh, volatility and the four capital account management as, a, as an instrument of prevention. Uh, then uh, with the issue of uh, lending uh, by the IMF, uh, or emergency lending is how I call it in the book. Uh, and, and the third is uh, debt workouts, how do you resolve debts uh, when they occur, uh, whether you have a, an international system for international debt management. Uh, and finally, I, 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 work, I, I discuss governance issues, and I basically discuss uh, three <coughs> governance issues. The, uh, uh, what the apex organization of the system is, uh, which today is the G20, in the past the G7, but the IMF had been created to be that institution. Uh, so I, you know, I discussed that uh, topic. The, the second is um, the issue of quota and, and votes in the IMF. Uh, and the third, uh, which is in a sense my fun topic and one in which uh, uh, I actually came to know uh, uh, Ulrich in, in the in the past, which is the issue of what I call the uh, the multi-layer architecture of the system. So aside from having a, a global organization, regional and sub-regional uh, organizations that are also part uh, of the system. So let me b uh, refer to each of these topics uh, briefly. So on the global research system, um, you can say there are two, uh, I mean, the literature has discussed two approaches which I increasingly see them as complementary, and actually nothing but complementarity can actually, in my, way, in my view, work. Uh, the first is the multi-currency standard that, you know, that theoretically with, uh, uh, was designed after the breakdown uh, of the original Bretton Woods uh, Agreement in 1971. Um, now, it doesn't work quite as such, uh, uh, basically because uh, uh, the other currencies are, are much less important than the U.S. dollar in the system, but th there is a, a potential competition and um, probably at least one country uh, that is China, uh, wants its currency to become a really important uh, part of the system. So, so I discuss, I mean, the, and the advantages and disadvantages of, of that. Uh, the advantages being that the, uh, that the flexibility of the exchange rates uh, actually make the system much more resilient uh, than the, old, the older systems, particularly the dollar gold system that, uh, that was designed at Bretton Woods and that broke down in 1971. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, uh, it's equally inequ inequitable uh, than the current system uh, in the sense that it will be the currencies of major countries uh, that uh, will be the uh, international currencies, which means that most of countries of the world, including my own, will have no share in the system. Uh, so the second is actually a, a true international currency. Uh, and, and the only true international currency today uh, that we have are the special drawing rights of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, so I, that's why I put a lot of emphasis in that and, and the possibility of more actively using the special drawing rights, which are actually going to turn 50 next year. Uh, uh, so so, the, uh, so the, the, I think they have a, an interesting role to play, and, and, and particularly in one, uh, one specific way, uh, which is uh, uh, to use uh, a special drawing rights to finance IMF programs. Uh, so in a sense, making it, uh, the, the IMF a bit of a, a quasi-central bank. I mean, we all central banks uh, create money by lending. Uh, okay? That's the way um, money is created in the, in the fiduciary system that we have today. Uh, so why the hell should we do not, you know, should, uh, we don't, don't we do the same with the IMF? Uh, I use the uh, special drawing right, which is the money issued by the International Monetary Fund, as an instrument. So I, I dedicated a lot to, to special drawing rights. And I, I must say, when I started to work on this a few years, I was astonished to see that there was no research on the topic, uh, except the few uh, periodic uh, reports produced by the IMF itself. Uh, so the, uh, uh, what I will uh, emphasize is that the, there is a, an interesting recent literature on this. Uh, actually, the uh, uh, perhaps the the, uh, the large issuance of, uh, of SDRs uh, uh, after the uh, 2008 crisis, in the, actually in the London meeting of the GPO 20 uh, in uh, uh, what was it, February or March uh, 
2008, nine, nine, uh, that decided to do this big issuance of SDRs, uh, you know, it just uh, uh, led, uh, led to a, a discussion, again, on the role of the SDRs. And there had been uh, several papers trying to estimate the, you know, the possibility of using the SDRs more actively and, and the size of the issuance that can be done. And I would say, generally speaking, um, a, you know, something between $200 billion and, and $400 billion is something that the system can absorb. Uh, basically, because the the annual accumulation of foreign exchange reserves uh, in the world is larger than that, so this would be a fraction of that accumulation of foreign exchange reserves uh, uh, by the system. Uh, but but the most important um, uh, issue is, uh, is to use SDRs uh, as a mechanism of financing of IMF lending, and uh, and if you want to introduce some development link, as it it. it it was called in the discussion of the 1960s when the issue of the creating the SDRs was being uh, uh, <coughs> debated. Uh, you know, I, I, I would think that the most important is probably uh, uh, to allocate uh, or, or to include a, crit a criterion uh, in the SDR allocation that will take in, uh, into account the demand for reserves by countries, uh, which means that developing countries should have a larger share let's say, in the allocations, uh, because they do have a larger demand for reserves. But I would say that that's probably uh, a, a solution that will not be adopted. So for me, the most important issue is actually how to use SDRs more actively, particularly to, uh, as a source of lending of the, by the IMF. In terms of the, the history of the allocations, uh, uh, this is a brief summary. Uh, you see the... Uh, uh, the uh, developing countries, which are in, uh, in, the, in the lower groups, uh, middle-income and low-income countries, um, uh, get, uh, although they have an increasing share in the allocations uh, since the first allocations uh, of 1970-72, uh, they still receive less than 40%, which is much less than their share in the world economy uh, uh, today. The last reform, and, and actually there is a quite an, an active market for SDRs. Uh, I must be the only one who has studied this topic, <laughs> because uh, so I studied the you know how who sells and buys SDRs, um, uh, and actually I, I was uh, 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 struck by the fact that many developed countries, including the UK, have actually used the SDRs, uh, but also the US actually at one point. Uh, has also used their SDRs to, you know, as an instrument of payment. But of course, most of the payments, uh, I mean, the most active users are developing countries, are probably low-income countries. Uh, so, and because they, they, they need a, a, a more resource. But you, you see the, uh, this is the amount of, um, uh, <coughs> of a net drawings so of the net use of SDRs by countries, uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, in, in the in the in the um, let's say in the middle of, of this graph, uh, it, it was actually about fifty percent of SDRs were actually used by countries, uh, but the, the 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 big jump recently is because of the allocation of uh, uh, of two thousand and nine, okay, uh, which has led of course to more active use of SDRs again by countries. The um, on the macroeconomic cooperation and the exchange rate system. Um, uh, the basic point that I make uh, uh, is that the G20, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the G20 uh, uh, and the G7 before, or the G10 before the G7, uh, which was this group in OECD uh, of major countries, uh, all, all these uh, mechanisms of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, designing the cooperation of major countries uh, do play a, a, an important role, but they have basically two deficiencies. Uh, the first deficiency is that uh, nobody elected them to do that. Right? They, are, they, they do that because they are most, more powerful. Uh, uh, so they, so they, they are not, a, in a sense, a legitimate set, a system. Uh, every time I'm invite, invited by, you know, to a G20 meeting, and I, I'm invited to a few of them, uh, I always say, well, this institution is not legitimate because my country is not a member. I never elected you to become, you know, uh, to be the the leaders of the world. You know, of course, you know, you are very important anyway, <laughs> but uh, but I didn't elect, you know, you. Uh, uh, 
And I contrast it with actually Article 1.1 of the Articles of Agreement of the IMF, uh, which said, as I said, that, that the IMF was created to promote international monetary cooperation. Okay. But I say most cooperation takes place outside the IMF. Uh, which is a topic that, uh, that I came to call elite multilateralism. You know? uh, so multilateralism of the elite countries uh, that you know take you know themselves the responsibility for for this. Now, in that process, uh, the the G20 actually created a very interesting process, uh, which uh, I analyze uh, extensively, uh, <clears throat> uh, which is the what is called the uh, the indicative the guidelines of the mutual assessment process. Uh, and I think actually this is a, a, a starting point for a, a very interesting uh, topic, which, uh, in, in my view, uh, uh, should be managed by the IMF itself. Uh, so something like the idea uh, that was created for global imbalances before the 2008 crisis, uh, which is basically a, a group of major economies uh, uh, in the IMF that are, respond that are responsible for the whole, uh, to the whole membership of the IMF which I think will be a much better system, uh, actually also because the G20 has many economies that are not systemically relevant. Uh, so you can actually discard about half of the members of the G20 for any interesting mechanism of macroeconomic cooperation. But what is important is that the members of that, of the, of that group should be selected you know, through a, a, a bit of uh, at least some democratic process of, sort, of, sort, of a sort, uh, and that they respond to the whole uh, membership of the IMF. Um, I will not go into global imbalances uh, as such, which is the major issue that has to be discussed in the macroeconomic uh, cooperation, except, that to, uh, except to say that, um, and I discuss this extensively in the, bo in, the, uh, in the book, that the, uh, uh, that the global imbalances uh, uh, seem to uh, reassert themselves once and again. So every time you are apparently correcting some imbalances, new imbalances uh, uh, show up <laughs> in the system. For example, in the since the 2008 crisis, we have seen a significant reduction in the in the Chinese su surplus, in the uh, uh, in the Japanese surplus. Uh, but at the same time, we have seen, and this is a more interesting uh, story, uh, and, and of course a huge reduction in the U.S. deficit, which is the bottom. <coughs> but at the same time, we have seen new imbalances, and, and I think the most uh, important imbalance that I discuss in the book is the fact that this, you see, the red line that the European Union without UK, the UK and, and without Germany, uh, the UK being a deficit country, Germany being a, a now the most uh, surplus country in the world, uh, you know, which uh, actually uh, turned from a, a, a fairly large de a deficit to a, a large surplus, equivalent to about 1% of world GDP, uh, according to my estimates. Uh, and someone had to absorb all these uh, effects. Uh, of the reduction of the U.S. surplus, uh, or the U.S. deficit, and the uh, turning around of the European Union's uh, deficit into a surplus, uh, and who did that? Well, China and India, uh, China and Japan on the one hand, but also developing countries. So the the blue line, the, the light blue line, uh, are the uh, developing countries who are without the oil economies and without China. Uh, so that's why, in a sense, the, you know, if some countries reduce uh, their, their deficit or generate surpluses, somebody in the else must be in the other direction. And what happened is that, you know, aside from, uh, uh, from China and Japan, uh, developing countries also absorb the, the, uh, the increasing tension. Now, on the, on the exchange rate non-system, uh, uh, I discussed the history of, of this arrangement and, and the idea that this is the most uh, non-system of the non-system the strongest element because there is actually the decision to flow the exchange rates uh, was uh, totally un, uh, unexpected. Actually, it was a de facto uh, reality after the, uh, the U.S. Uh, broke the, uh, uh, the parity of the, uh, or eliminated the convertibility of, uh, uh, of dollars into gold. Uh, and, uh, and what happened afterwards was that nobody, they tried to fix, uh, again, uh, the exchange rates, and they were totally incapable of doing that. And so the, the, there was the decision in March 1973 just to float, because it was a def you know, there was no alternative, in a sense. The European countries, of course, designed their own system of non-floating, which so the Europe always maintained a kind of Bretton Woods arrangement of uh, limited fl uh, flexibility of the currencies, because of the importance given to, uh, to 
uh, to that in order to have deeper international trade uh, within the European Union. Anyway, uh, and the other exception uh, which was introduced into the IMF Articles of Agreement in 1976 is that the only uh, so the countries were free to choose whatever exchange rate they choose so, so long as they don't quote unquote manipulate the exchanges. Uh, but the only problem is that that manipulation has never been defined. Uh, so it's the element uh, in the system that it has not been defined, and there is always this discussion in, Euro in the U.S., in particular whether the U.S. is going to call uh, a country, which means China in particular, as a country that is manipulating the exchange rate. Although and sometimes in relation to Germany, they have come closer in recent uh, months uh, to also accuse the Euro, uh, the Euro area to, of manipulating the exchange rate. Uh, anyway. So the, 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 and the problem is that this system, or this non-system as it is, doesn't really contribute uh, to correcting the, correcting the global imbalances, which show up once and again. So in that regard, um, uh, I go for, for an alternative that was discussed extensively again in the 1970s and has come back once and again, for example, in the works of John Williamson, uh, who is a major uh, analyst of these issues which is basically having some indicative of target zones uh, for exchange rates. Um, uh, and actually, when you look at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the indicative lines of the mutual assessment process, the G20, uh, you can actually choose the indicators uh, because they, have all, they are already among those indicators. So I said, well, why don't you take, uh, do we take those indicators as the, the clue to understand uh, what is the role of macroeconomic cooperation? Okay, on crisis, on crisis prevention and resolution, as I said, I discussed the uh, three issues. The first one uh, is, uh, is capital account management. Um, I have always refused to use controls uh, at the word because I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those uses of the language uh, which has a negative connotation. So for, for financial regulation, nobody uses financial controls, right? But when you manage uh, uh, capital account issues, you always use controls, capital controls. And so, so there is a bit of a negative connotations uh, in the term. So I, for a long time, I have used the word regulations, and some other people uh, use the word management, uh, which is actually the word used by the IMF itself. Um, uh, although the word controls is actually in the Articles of Agreement. Uh, uh, but anyway. Whatever term you use, uh, the basic point uh, uh, that I make in the book, and this is probably a topic, uh, the, the, the specific topic that I have done more, more, uh, uh, most work on uh, throughout the years, um, um, is that you know the, the regulation of capital flows uh, does make sense uh, from the point of view uh, of macroeconomic management, uh, and and I would say for at least two different reasons. Uh, first of all, because it does give uh, countries more autonomy to manage their macro macroeconomic policies, which is why uh, they were introduced uh, in, the, in the IMF Articles of Agreement by the, uh, uh, by the architects of the, of the agreement. Uh, and of course, John Maynard Keynes was one of the strongest advocates uh, uh, of that point of view. Uh, uh, but the second is, uh, uh, now, you take this issue to, uh, uh, to the present, that when you have a, a world economy uh, that generates very different trends in the different uh, par uh, parts of the economy, uh, you may want to have countries with uh, very low interest rates uh, and some countries with a higher interest rate. This is the world we have lived uh, uh, with in the last 10 years. You know, developed countries, which uh, were in a bit of a mess, uh, after the crisis, uh, have maintained a very low interest rate, zero or negative. <laughs> uh, uh, but at the same time, the developing countries could not handle that uh, because they, they did not ha have a, as a strong a crisis as the developed countries. So they want to have a, you know, a positive interest rate for sure, uh, and sometimes a, a relatively high a positive rate. Uh, so in that system, uh, the only way to make the system coherent is to allow uh, different trajectories for the monetary policy of different countries. And that is very difficult, as, uh, as one of your professors I've learned, as one of your professors, Helen Ray, uh, has actually uh, pointed out. 
that there is actually probably uh, with the amount of capital mobility that we have today, there is actually no way to dissociate yourself from the uh, trends in international interest rates, uh, which means basically to dissociate yourself from the U.S. monetary policy. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, uh, this is, of, of course, a, a very important issue. And, uh, and I said capital account management should be an inherent uh, part of macroeconomic management uh, uh, because of that capacity. And, and probably it will be better, as the IMF uh, said in, uh, in when it discussed the institutional, uh, uh, the institutional view of the IMF on this topic, which was discussed in 2012, uh, is that uh, 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 not only uh, um, uh, uh, should we allow uh, capital account management, uh, but actually we should have more cooperation uh, to manage it, uh, uh, and probably uh, uh, by the major source countries, let's say. Uh, by the way, um, when I was finance minister, uh, I represented my country. I, I was actually, uh, we were in the discussion led by Michel Candesou as my, uh, managing director of the IMF to introduce capital account convertibility in the IMF articles of agreement, which is basically to eliminate the possibility of using uh, capital account management. And uh, all developing countries were against that idea. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I actually was elect, uh, selected to talk in the name of Latin America against that view that fortunately we defeated, okay, <laughs> at the time. Now, in terms of crisis resolution, uh, there is a, in, in the book a discussion of, uh, of the history of the different uh, arrangements. Um, uh, and, and I said in two th the reform of 2009-2010 uh, was probably the most ambitious reform of credit lines in history. Uh, they included the, the doubling of all facilities, uh, the, uh, the, the creation of a, uh, of a contingency uh, facility, uh, the flexible credit line, which uh, very few countries have used, but actually my country is one of those countries that have used it. Uh, uh, so it's a flexible, it's a kind of contingency line that uh, you get and, and you use if uh, you need it, otherwise you just leave the money in the, in the hands of the IMF. Uh, and facility, uh, and particularly, there were more flexible facilities also for low-income countries. Uh, uh, but on top of that, it has been also a history of, of conditionality, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, without going uh, very far, uh, conditionality was clearly a strength in the 1970s and notably in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, uh, with the uh, Latin American debt crisis, but also um, most, probably most, even more importantly, uh, by the uh, uh, the collapse of communism in Europe, uh, which led all these countries, uh, uh, former communist countries, come to the to the IMF for, res uh, I mean, becoming IMF members and then asking for resources from the IMF, and then conditionality peak. All sorts of structural conditionality uh, uh, was. Uh, introduced uh, much worse than the one Latin America uh, had experienced in the 1980s. Now, when this East Asian crisis struck in 1997, uh, and the IMF came with this uh, very tough conditionality, there was a rebellion, I mean, to put it frankly, uh, of members uh, led by actually for the East Asian countries. Uh, and, uh, and the result of that was a, 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 most, a very interesting discussion of the role uh, of IMF conditionality, uh, which actually uh, uh, was very positive. Uh, uh, and th there was a decision in 2002 uh, on uh, IMF conditionality, which basically uh, uh, established the point uh, that it has to be macro relevant. So you may want to have free trade. You may want to have privatization, uh, I mean, the IMF. Uh, but you know those are not supposed to be conditions in IMF lending, OK? Uh, so that was a very uh, a major step forward. In a sense, macro-relevant conditionality had been the history of the IMF uh, before the 1970s, OK? So this was returning to the old form of conditionality. And there was a, a further uh, advance in 2009 uh, uh, with the elimination of what, what are called the structural benchmarks. Uh, that means if there is a structural conditionality and you break it, uh, that cannot uh, uh, lead to a suspension in the uh, in in the disbursement of the funds that have been approved by the IMF. Okay, so in 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 those regards, uh, we are today. Uh, and this, by the way, there is a recent report of the Independent Evaluation Office, 
uh, updating a previous report on conditionality in which they show that actually there has been a quite a significant advance in terms of reducing IMF conditionality. But in any case, IMF conditionality is still seen as a major obstacle uh, uh, to borrow from the IMF, particularly by the Asian countries. They, they really do not want to go back to the IMF after the experience of the late 1990s. Okay. Um, just, this is just a, a, a brief history of the, of the lending the, and the peaks. Uh, uh, this is a, as a proportion of world GDP. Uh, the, the, the light blue lines are developed countries. Uh, interestingly, in the first decades, uh, the uh, developed countries were uh, very active borrowers from the IMF. Uh, and in my, uh, I have a, a table that has the major borrowers, uh, you know, every five years, uh, or, or every ten years, excuse me, every decade. Uh, and surprise, surprise, the UK was one. <laughs> okay, it was a major borrower from the IMF. The other actually major borrower was India. So the UK and India were the, by far the most important borrower. But France was also an important borrower um, uh, uh, from the IMF. Germany had, at, at one point, a, a loan. Uh, Japan did, although Japan became a late member, et cetera, et cetera. So, so major developed countries uh, uh, were actually uh, quite active users of the IMF. But that stopped altogether. Uh, uh, the, the last peak uh, that you see there uh, uh, was the, after the first oil shock. Uh, but after that, the uh, basically developed countries uh, ceased to be borrowers from the IMF, and everything is dominated by the by the uh, by the uh, black line, which are developing and emerging economies. Okay. Uh, now, in the recent crisis, uh, what is interesting is that the developed countries uh, came back. Uh, you know, with the case of uh, let's say Ireland, Portugal, uh, Greece, uh, uh, Iceland, uh, uh, which became again borrowers from the IMF. Uh, so there is actually a more imp interesting balance. This is very important because the IMF was never supposed to be a north-south institution like the World Bank was supposed to was designed. So the World Bank was uh, supposed to lend only to developing countries. The IMF was uh, was a, a true cooperative, let's say, in that sense that all countries could borrow from it. And, and some developed countries have always uh, been important borrowers. And the third issue that I discuss, so in, in this actually, my, my point is that in terms of lending lines, so the emergency financing, uh, we probably have the, uh, one of the best systems in, in history today. You know, with, with the major problem is that uh, uh, many countries, including the Asian countries, refuse to uh, borrow from the IMF. Uh, so there's a stigma associated to borrowing from the IMF, as, which is the topic, the term used in the literature. And, uh, uh, and that can only be solved by, um, uh, by you know, more flexible lines of, of different sort. Uh, and in my view, the, um, uh, the, the best would be uh, actually something like a swap credit line, uh, which is actually the system that is used by, develop <coughs> by developed countries. I actually discussed in, the, in my chapter on macro cooperation the role of the US Fed credit lines, OK? Uh, the swap credit lines, and I show that they are much more important than the uh, IMF. Uh, actually, they, uh, in the, after 2008, they, they reached a peak that was about four times uh, this, the size of IMF uh, lending. So something like that is what uh, should be developed <clears throat> for developing countries also. But the third topic is that the debt crisis resolution, and the basic topic here is that we don't have institutions to manage this problem. Uh, and. Uh, uh, which is a topic that has been discussed once and again, uh, with two views, uh, <coughs> the market view, which is the one that has prevailed, um, uh, including in the most recent decision uh, of 2014, uh, after the uh, big Argentinian uh, debt crisis, uh, uh, with uh, some d decisions by U.S. courts against Argentina, uh, which basically led to a decision to uh, facilitate, let's say, the uh, market uh, uh, negotiations of uh, uh, when the, you have a, a, a debt problems. Uh, and, the and the others uh, uh, was, is to create a, a very uh, institutional mechanism uh, for, uh, for debt resolution. And, uh, uh, and the most important attempt was actually led by the IMF uh, uh, through the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism between 2002 and 2004. That is after the East Asian crisis, uh, and and there was, uh, I think the initial proposals were uh, non-started, 
Uh, but the last proposals uh, uh, after the discussion of the, of the two years, I think we're a beginning of something that can be acceptable. And actually, I come in favor of something like that uh, in my book. Uh, 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 so the, 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 what is the, of the essence of this uh, is, first of all, that whatever debt uh, resolution uh, power the IMF has, has to be totally independent from the IMF board. Uh, so it has to be more like uh, what we have in the WTO, in which debt resolution, uh, I mean, trade dispute resolution is in the hands of a totally autonomous uh, uh, body, uh, uh, which is independent from the board. Uh, and that's basically what, you know, the idea that I, I think the, uh, you could, of course, create the debt resolution uh, uh, mechanism in the United Nations. Uh, but that will be creating a, a, a new institution that would be totally unacceptable for some countries. That's why uh, I think trying to build something in the IMF is probably uh, the best. Finally, on the governance of the system, um, uh, I, I discussed uh, three issues, the, the voice and representation of developing countries in the IMF, in the Bretton Woods in, in general, uh, a representative apex organization instead of the elite multilateralism that we have in place, uh, and finally, uh, a, a denser multilayer architecture. Uh, uh, on the uh, quote and voting power, uh, uh, the major mechanism is the overrepresentation of Europe and the, the repression of Asia. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, there's an agreement that all seats must be elected, but this is a, a kind of fictitious uh, agreement because some countries have the possibility of electing themselves. So, so you have you are country that you know that will be on the table anyway, which is okay. Um, and there are other institutional issues. Um, uh, I will uh, uh, stand particularly by by the third. Well, the proper function of the constituency system is very important. The constituencies are the groupings of countries that cannot elect themselves, uh, like my own. Uh, so you have a constituency, and, and the problem is how to make uh, you know constituencies work better. Uh, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, uh, uh, working with some of those constituencies, for example, the Canadian constituency, which includes uh, uh, the Caribbean countries, is a very well-functioning constituency. But there are other constituencies uh, uh, which uh, are actually not, uh, uh, not homogeneous and, uh, in their views on, on, on different topics. And of course, the competitive merit-based election of the IMF managing director and the World Bank president. Uh, it's a, uh, I, I can't, uh, uh, you know, I, I was at one point candidate for the uh, World Bank president, so I know this is, um, this is important and we're very far from that. <laughs> anyway, and this is the last reform. Uh, uh, there is a, 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 of the IMF uh, uh, quotas and um, voting power. Um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, let me underscore one point, uh, but, but let me discuss that we are uh, in another uh, a discussion again on this topic. So this topic was uh, uh, launched again as a, a topic discussion last year, so we're actually in the midst of, an, of a new reform of this topic. Uh, uh, as you can see, you have developing, developed countries on the left and developing countries on the right. And what is clear is that the uh, developed countries did uh, give uh, a, a bit less than 4% of the quota, actually the, what I call the European G10, which is one of, way of collecting the most important members of the uh, European members, uh, lost a bit more than 4%. And that, of course, was, uh, uh, was won by developed countries, developing countries, excuse me, but there are a few developing countries that accumulated all of that additional quota, uh, which means China, India, Brazil, Mexico, and Korea. Okay. Um, which is still included in that, in that list of as a developing country. Anyway, actually, you see that m many of the uh, developing countries actually lost. So that negative 3.4 uh, is other developing countries that lost uh, in the quota location, including at the end the low-income countries. So the the the, um, uh, the vote reform was a bit better, uh, and this is because the the basic votes uh, were increased. Uh, the basic votes uh, are, the, they say, the one country, one votes uh, system of the, uh, in the IMF. Uh, the UN is, of course, one country, one vote. 
but in the IMF it's one dollar, one vote, right? Uh, so, but the, so there's a mix in the IMF actually between the two, and, and in, in this reform, uh, the, the weight of the, uh, uh, of the basic uh, votes was increased, and this is very important for small countries uh, uh, and, and for poor countries. The small poor countries are really bad uh, in the one dollar, one vote system, let's say. And as you can see, the, uh, in, in this, uh, the, the loss of developed countries was higher. Uh, and now the rest of developing countries lost much less. But particularly, the low-income countries actually won uh, a bit uh, in terms of voting power. So, the, uh, so that's why in any reform uh, of the voting power in the IMF, I think this role of the basic votes uh, is uh, quite, quite important uh, today. The second is the APEX representation. Uh, I have an analysis basically with something that we did with Joe Stiglitz on the on this uh, the G20 on my elite multilateralism, uh, saying that uh, uh, that it, it, it was uh, very effective in, uh, uh, in 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 showing leadership and, and and some proposals for reform in the early part of the crisis, but um, uh, but later uh, the effectiveness has been quite limited. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and there is this uh, issue that, uh, uh, that it has a, uh, a, a very peculiar uh, capacity to, uh, to self-select new topics. So the accumulation of topics in, in the G20 uh, uh, has increased through time. And uh, you can see and, uh, there are some very good Canadian analysis of, the, uh, of, the, of what these topics mean, and they essentially mean very little. Uh, so it will be better to concentrate again on the core issues uh, uh, which it developed in the early phase of its crisis. Actually, the London meeting of the, of the G20 was by far the best uh, in terms of decisions and effectiveness, let's say, of the G20. After that, uh, there was a clear deterioration in the uh, effectiveness. But of course, uh, the most negative is, the, as I said, there is a self-appointed ad hoc body uh, for, with problems of representation, so it doesn't represent myself. Uh, and uh, as a member, as a Colombian citizen, and Colombia has no seat on the table, we are not represented. So for me, this is not a legitimate one. <laughs> if I cannot uh, have a voice in the selection of the members, um, anyway. So and so the uh, you can say there are two proposals uh, you can decide. But the uh, uh, we come, uh, I come in favor, of course, of the proposal of the Stiglitz Commission uh, of uh, 2009. Uh, uh, which is actually to create a, uh, what we call a global. Uh, I was a member of that commission, so uh, and I actually more or less wrote this part of the proposal, <laughs> uh, which is a, what is called the Global Economic Coordination Council, uh, which is part of, which should be a part of the UN system, and not the UN organization. This difference for for those of us who have worked in the United Nations, I, I did I worked for ten years, uh, is a very important uh, difference. So the, the UN system includes actually the IMF and the World Bank. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a, bro it's a broader uh, set of organizations. Uh, the UN organization is the little uh, part of this, or the smaller part of the system that is directly controlled by the General Assembly, let's say, of the United Nations. Uh, that is basically, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the secretariat, as, as it is called, the, of the IMF. Plus a few organizations that are directly dependent on the uh, on the secretary, including the, let's say UNCTAD or uh, UNICEF uh, or UNDP, let's say. But most of the uh, 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 specialized organizations uh, are not uh, part of that um, little body the, of the UN organization, but the UN system. So our proposal is something like uh, a, a body uh, that would be uh, a, for the UN system. Uh, and, uh, and of course, with the uh, participation of all countries uh, who will elect the members, uh, actually through a weighted vote system, so it's something more similar to the World Bank and the IMF uh, uh, way of uh, uh, naming members than uh, than other UN, uh, than the UN organization, which really elects on the basis of one country, one vote. Right. Uh, uh, so that's the the proposal. But you can think of uh, the other alternative, which is give the more power to the IMF and have those smaller groups uh, of countries within the IMF uh, of selected the, of uh, 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 you know the major economies but rep uh, responding to the whole IMF membership 
And finally, uh, my proposal uh, of a multi-layer architecture. Uh, so uh, I, uh, the basic issue here uh, is that, uh, um, uh, that for smaller countries, uh, and particularly for developing countries, uh, 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 it is actually better to, to have, aside from the IMF, uh, some regional and sub-regional organizations uh, in which you have a stronger voice. Uh, uh, so, so representation is actually enhanced uh, in a very unequal world uh, by having different layers of, uh, uh, of organizations. Um, uh, and that's why I think the uh, a multi-layer architecture uh, is much better. And actually, uh, I use in, in, in the book uh, the, uh, the architecture, actually, of the, uh, of the system of multilateral development banks, uh, because that's a multi-layer architecture. Uh, so what I want is to have to see how we reproduce in the, in the international monetary system what we have developed for developed banks. And, and just to... Uh, this is an estimate for one year that I did. Uh, this is actually quite uh, uh, a complex estimation <laughs> of uh, a, how the different parts of the multilateral development banking system serve different parts of the world economy. Uh, I had in red the, uh, the, re the, uh, the uh, well, in, in blue is the World Bank, in red the, uh, the regional banks, and in uh, uh, green, uh, the uh, sub-regional and inter-regional banks. I mean, inter-regional banks, actually, we have had for some time one, which is the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, but we have now uh, uh, two more, the, uh, the New Development Bank from the uh, BRICS country and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which I thought was going to be a regional bank, but is now throughout the world trying to find members. So it actually wants to be a, an inter-regional bank. Uh, uh, whatever the uh, this is the share of the system, and what is very interesting, uh, actually here, first of all, is uh, the Middle East is the best served uh, part of the of the system. But uh, uh, then you have many other regions in which you have a, a, a significant uh, a, a service from the multilateral development banks from different combinations. Uh, Europe, for example, is basically served by the European Investment Bank. Uh, but uh, you see, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa is basically the World Bank. Uh, and, and you see in Latin America, it's actually uh, the regional development banks. Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting story. And, and, and the smaller, uh, aside from the U.S., which I don't have here in my table because it's uh, more or less irrelevant uh, in terms of service of multilateral development banks, uh, although they do have uh, one little uh, multilateral bank, which is the North, Am uh, North American Development Bank, which basically uh, services Mexico. <laughs> uh, but the, the smaller one is actually uh, East Asia and the Pacific, basically East Asia. Uh, and that's why I think the Chinese are right, that they have to increase the size of that bar. <laughs> that the, the, the bar is uh, too little, and, and that's why the Chinese have been at the center of many of the proposals. So this is a, a, the, my proposal for multi-layer architecture. Uh, my comparison here is with the, um, uh, with the uh, international monetary system, which you, you basically have a, an empty space <laughs> in many parts of the world. Actually, the European stability mechanism being the most important, uh, followed by the Shanma Initiative, you know, being the two most important. Actually, uh, uh, and I, I will end with this comment, uh, the... Um, uh, you don't have to have a, a very large monetary institution uh, uh, of a regional or sub regional uh, level uh, to have a, a good service. And actually, I discuss in the, uh, in the book uh, one example that is a very successful institution uh, from my part of the world, which is the Latin American Reserve Fund, uh, which was created as an Andean Reserve Fund that then allowed uh, new members from Latin America uh, and that has been a very successful institution. It has actually facilitated uh, 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 money to, uh, to all members. Um, uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, being, although it's very little, this one, <laughs> uh, it's very little, uh, it actually uh, 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 has lent to our countries more than the IMF. <laughs> Uh, so you, you, you don't have to have huge institutions, but you know very functional 
uh, institution that uh, play that uh, role. But thank you very much. Uh, this book, uh, which is called Resetting International Monetary Non-System, uh, is actually uh, uh, freely available uh, for downloading, uh, from both from Oxford University Press, uh, but I have here the, uh, uh, the, the ones who pay for the free loading uh, of the book, which was the United Nations University Wider Institute. Uh, so you can also get into United Nations University Wider and also you'll find the book uh, uh, to download. So it's a freely available book. Uh, I, I hope several of you will uh, go through it, and I think, it's, I think it's a nice book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose Antonio, for this really thought-provoking, highly interesting, and highly relevant uh, speech, and um, I have actually, I don't have an awful lot of time to read books, but I did read this one, and it really is worth read, and it's uh, blending history uh, with the current uh, problems, and uh, it's not only uh, analyzing the problem, but really putting forward some very sensible solutions, I believe. So um, we'll, we'll give Jose Antonio a little time to, to recoup his breath, and uh, I'd like to ask Stephanie to deliver her comments before I will uh, add some as well. And uh, so Stephanie has also a wealth of experience on, on the issues Jose Antonio covered. Uh, she's worked actually very closely with Jose Antonio, also with Joe Stiglitz uh, at Columbia University. Uh, so we're very lucky to have her to share her insights. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Uli, for your kind introduction and also for organizing this important event. Um, I'm really delighted to be a commentator of this book, which, which really is excellent and which I can very warmly recommend. Um, I think all of Jose Antonio's work is, is very good, but this one is really, really outstanding. So I, I really recommend you to read it. And I think as Uli already said, uh, one of the things that is very attractive is, is that in every one of the chapters, you start with the history, usually going back to Bretton Woods. Then you, uh, then um, Jose Antonio uh, brings out the key dilemmas or issues. And thirdly, he proposes policy. And I think it's quite a rare mixture, uh, which works extremely well. Um, and I think, and the other thing that I think is very positive is that the book is, is quite radical, because obviously we need a radical reform of the international monetary non-system, as he calls it. But on the other hand, it's also uh, in, in some ways quite moderate, that, so that it's on the limit of where you could actually imagine that the, the political will could be mustered, hopefully, by the major countries to actually do these reforms. So I, I think that is a good trick for proposing potentially successful reforms. Uh, so I think um, that this lack of a proper international monetary system is one of the key weaknesses of the international economy, combined with the lack of a proper international financial system, I think, which um, um, we, we've done a lot of work on with, with Jose Antonio. And I, I want to just initially make a general point that, for example, uh, what Trump is proposing is to restrict trade and to deregulate finance, including international finance. And this is exactly the wrong solution because the evidence is quite strong that international trade has net benefits, although, of course, it has major issues of redistribution, particularly within countries. So there needs to be some, uh, some change of that. Uh, but in terms of finance, the net, benef the, the net effects on countries and on the world economy is often negative. Yeah, good. And we've had, of course, a lot of evidence from that and also theoretical. So it's exactly uh, the wrong thing that, that the current US president is focusing on. And what, what the world needs is to focus on how to fix this deeply dysfunctional monetary and financial system and just to improve a bit 
uh, the operations of trade, mainly, I think, through measures at national or regional levels. Um, so I think that's a very important uh, point to make. Um, I think uh, one of the key things that comes came out clearly to me after reading this book is that if we look at the international monetary and financial system as a whole, there are these negative interactions between a number of factors, and some of which have already been, of course, discussed by Jose Antonio. The first is the asymmetric adjustment of surplus and deficit countries, uh, which is has highly problematic effects on growth, employment, investment, and poverty reduction. This is, of course, an old problem, which Keynes tried to address at Bretton Woods, and he tried to fix it. In fact, the IMF has a scarce currency clause that should be applied to surplus countries, but it's never been imposed. Uh, now, this problem has in some ways got worse in Europe, because after the, the uh, so-called global financial crisis, which we call the North Atlantic financial crisis, because it, this is where it happened, it's, um, in the Eurozone, um, there emerged this deep asymmetry between the way in which surplus and deficit countries had to adjust. There was intense pressure on the deficit countries, particularly those that, that were in the middle of the crisis, uh, like Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Ireland, but also uh, on Italy, which wasn't in crisis but has a high level of debt, to adjust, and adjust in a major way, downwards. Very, very draconian adjustment. And there was no successful uh, pressure on Germany and Holland, which have vast surpluses. And I think this is a cause of, it was very bad for the European economy, and it has been also very bad for the rest of the world, including the developing world, because it has imposed a deflationary bias into the world economy and into the, the Eurozone. And I think one reason why I think is very worrying from the perspective of thinking about reform of the system, that the Eurozone is a rather integrated, um, uh, politically integrated and economic integrated region. A lot of people in this country think it's too integrated. I, I think it's not enough integrated. But even this very integrated uh, group of countries, having this European Commission, having the IMF involved, is not able really to put pressure and uh, change the mind of the policymakers in Germany and in Holland to adjust, to expand, because they have all this fiscal space, they have space to increase wages and so on. So I think this asymmetry of adjustment is deeply troubling. How, how if we can't do it within the Eurozone, how can it be done uh, internationally? Um, I mean, there are, for example, rules. The European Commission has a rule that any country that has a fiscal sur that has a current account surplus bigger than six percent should adjust uh, by expansion, or if not, pay a fine. But it hasn't been invoked because Germany has had a current account surplus of eight percent of GDP for, for the last, I don't know, ten years. Holland has had for ten percent, and nothing has happened to them. The Commission. Uh, hardly says anything. So this is a, a major problem and a very costly problem if we think of countries like Greece where GDP fell by over 25%. So this is this lack of, of symmetry in the adjustment process and this bias towards deflation is a major problem. And of course, the developing countries in this case and the emerging economies are bystanders who suffer from this. The second problem is uh, the large spillovers of um, macroeconomic policies in developed countries. And particularly, I've talked about fiscal before, but now I'm talking particularly about monetary policy and especially about monetary policy in the United States, uh, which by having uh, the US dollar as main currency system has a major impact on the rest of the world. This has always been the case, and you have, we have the work of people like Galvon, and, and Reinhardt and others, who, who showed the importance of US monetary policy to determining capital flows. But it has become even more dramatic since, since the 2007-9 crisis because of the large scale of quantitative easing. As you know, 
um, the US, but also the Eurozone, the UK, Japan, have, have started a massive program of monetary easing, uh, which led, accompanied, of course, by very low interest rates, and as Jose Antonio said, even zero or even negative interest rates. If you want to buy a German government bond, even today, 10 years after the crisis, you will get a negative yield in real terms, even in nominal terms, or almost, yeah. But so people in the developed countries didn't know where to put their savings, so they discovered, rediscovered emerging and developing countries, including sub-Saharan Africa, and there have been these massive capital flows to emerging economies and developing countries, uh, which, uh, of course, strengthened their currencies excessively, led to very large current account deficits, as, as the graph showed, and uh, led to very large levels of debt. Um, so there are very large spillovers from the effects of fiscal policies and monetary policies in the developed countries on emerging economies and on developing countries. So they are affected by this, but they have no influence in how these policies are determined. And furthermore, the policymakers in the developed countries have a domestic mandate. The mandate of the U.S. Fed is to ensure employment and, and price stability. Um, and you, I just learned from Jose Antonio today, long-term interest rates in the United States. Okay? And they're not a, supposed to look at the impact that uh, their monetary policy has on the rest of the world. I mean, this is fine if you're Ghana, because your monetary policy will not have major effects on the rest of the world. But if you're the US or you're the Eurozone or Japan, what you do has a major impact on the rest of the world. And there is no mechanism at present on how to, uh, how to have influence on the rest of the world on, on, on these policies. I mean, the IMF sometimes is actually writing good reports, arguing for correction of policies. But you know, it has no impact. The US does what it likes. Germany does what it likes. So this is a key problem of how we enforce change within the existing powers. The third issue, which is studied uh, by Jose Antonio and, and which we have studied a lot in the past, is the deeply dysfunctional private international financial system, both domestically and internationally. And this is a system which is the private finance is riddled with market imperfections and market failures, of which perhaps the biggest one is the boom-bust tendency of private markets, uh, which is accelerated, of course, by the dramatic deregulation that occurred in the time of the so-called Washington Consensus. And the dramatic rise of the scale of the financial sector globally and nationally, the increase of its complexity and the opaqueness of the institutions and some, some of the most critical mechanisms. In fact, it's called shadow banking, meaning that it's a part of the banking system which is not really regulated. And this, of course, leads also to boom busts in capital flows, domestically, domestic credit creation, but also in terms of capital flows, which has been so damaging to the developing and the emerging economies. I mean, capital inflows do have uh, some beneficial effects. Uh, but of course, well, particularly when they're short term, they have also very damaging effects. But even uh, in terms of uh, the so-called very beneficial uh, flows, like foreign direct investment, I've recently done some empirical work with Victor Murinda and other colleagues. And we found, to our surprise, that in capital flows to Africa, most of them, including FDI, if you look sectorally, don't have a positive effect on productivity. Because there are both the effects of volatility, but also the, the, they don't seem to go into the most dynamic sectors or to the companies that expand productivity. And it was quite a big shock, because we expected at least FDI to have net positive effects. But certainly, the, the short-term capital flows have deep, deeply um, problematic effects. The fourth point is that we have a useful, as Jose Antonio showed, but two small IMF lending facilities. 
um, that have had some improvements, as Jose Antonio pointed out, I would be a little bit less enthusiastic because in, in, in Europe, the IMF has been really, really very tough. Um, they, I think one of the problems is that they don't seem to learn uh, from the experiences. I remember talking to quite a senior person in the, in the Czech Central Bank, and she said to me, why didn't the IMF tell us all this? They told us all the good things that would happen if we liberalized the capital account, liberalized the financial, but they didn't say that the crisis, this was the time of the East Asian crisis, could happen. So why doesn't the IMF honestly explain the lesson? I think they have come a bit better, but um, as I will mention also later. But the key problems are that the facilities are too small, even though they have been improved, and the level of conditionality is still too high, and there's not enough automatic uh, lending, like the swap lines that Jose Antonio referred to, in face of purely external major shocks, like commodity price shocks uh, for, for poor countries and capital account shocks for the middle-income countries. And finally, as Jose Antonio explained, there is a lack of an international debt workout mechanism. So uh, I would like to make one nuance with Jose Antonio's book because he does it, and rightly, from the perspective of developing countries. Um, and it's very important to look at this through this lens. But I think one of the interesting points that emerged from the 2000, 2009, 2007, 2009 crisis is that these problems are also very important in the developed countries, in the so-called mature economies, because the crisis in the United States led to an estimated loss of output of about, according to the Fed, $1.6 trillion. Yeah? In the market, in the financial market, which is the deepest one in the world and supposedly the best. Yeah? So the flaws that we see, that we saw so clearly in the emerging economies, in Latin America, in East Asia, are also in different manifestations very deeply intrinsic in the developed countries, particularly when they have deregulated finance and not re regulated it properly. And I think this is in a way, I mean, it's a, it was a terrible crisis, but it may be good perhaps for international monetary and financial reform because there is a joint interest. It's not just South-North, but it's also an interest of all governments and presumably all the real economy to, to reform a system which doesn't work. It doesn't work for, for us in the third world, but it doesn't work for the first world either. Um, so, uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about the, the aspect of managing the capital account on which I've, I've worked quite a lot over the years and particularly uh, with Jose Antonio. Uh, as I said, the book is very nice on that, going back very relevantly in this case to the creation of Bretton Woods and the way that people then looked at it, including, for example, the UK and the US Treasury on the issue of capital account management and capital controls. And both Keynes and White, the, found, the founders of, of the Bretton Woods system, uh, were both very much in favor of allowing, of restricting the ability of countries to put barriers on trade, but allowing them to put barriers on the capital account. Um, and this was um, a, a very important and very clear in the Articles of Agreement. And Jose Antonio already told the story about how uh, the, particularly the Americans and the British wanted to, co to continue liberalizing also the capital account. And it was the eloquence of Jose Antonio that stopped them doing it, plus the East Asia financial crisis. Yeah, because this meeting was just as the East Asian crisis was beginning to happen. So the timing that the Americans and the IMF chose was very bad. Mm -hmm. But also, of course, reinforced by, by, by the clarity with which developing countries defended their position. Uh, so um, yeah. I'll, I'll be very brief now. So the key point is that since, since the global financial crisis, the IMF has changed its position. And it has now what is called its institutional view, which says that it's OK to use capital account management. It has some problems. First, it doesn't include the source countries. So I think to have a proper system of capital account management, you need also to have regulations in the source countries, as indeed Keynes argued. 
And as some papers in the IMF, like Gosh et al. 2014, actually shows the coordination of capital account management between source and deficit countries uh, would increase the, the cost effectiveness of such measures. Secondly, I think there's a risk that this new position of the IMF could, could be a little bit undermined, for example, by the position of the US government, but also um, a shift to the right in countries like Brazil. Uh, and finally, there is an inconsistency, I won't go into that, but because it takes a bit long, there's an inconsistency between this better IMF position and what is done through the trade mechanisms, through the WTO, and particularly through the bilateral investment treaties and the trade, uh, the trade bilateral and regional trade treaties, which force countries, particularly the US, force countries to liberalize the capital account. So you had, for example, the IMF praising Chilean capital controls, which have been very effective, and on the same time, when Chile was signing a free trade agreement with the United States, the US Treasury bullied Chile to seriously limit their so widely praised capital account management. So you have this inconsistency, and it's, there is a need for a sort of aggiornamento of the rules of the WTO and a, re a revision of all these bilateral uh, uh, investment and trade treaties. And our colleague, uh, Kevin Gallagher, with whom we did another book, also has done a lot of serious work in, in this area. And a, a reversal, for example, on the fact that when there is a, that a, an American bank or a European bank can sue a developing country, a bank, a, a private company can sue a developing country and take it to a private court uh, to decide whether that country should have a capital account liberalization, uh, which is, of course, absurd. And, and very much undermining of national policy autonomy. So to finalize, um, I think this, um, this is a right moment uh, where we, we are very clear that the world needs a new international financial uh, and monetary system. And uh, unfortunately, the political reality is, is moving against a, a more managed approach uh, to the world economy, um, a sort of stepping back from the good aspects of, of, of globalization. But maybe these things change, and I, I was very encouraged when, and this is a little bit of political publicity, when John McDonnell said that he's thinking of calling a, a conference of a new Bretton Woods. So maybe, maybe we will have some, some light uh, at the end of the tunnel, but, but we have, of course, a very clear need. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. This was also very, very thoughtful and inspiring. And uh, I fear I won't be able to compete with this now. Um, and also, we were running a little bit late. But, but I want to make three points. First one, um, as Stephanie just said in her last uh, uh, sentence, there is a very urgent need for greater international monetary cooperation, which, and I think we were not really seeing the discussion uh, we need on this topic at this moment. Um, there's, of course, an awful lot of discussion about uh, the global trade war, but this is an issue that is actually very closely related to the different flaws that Jose Antonio addressed in his lecture today. Um, so uh, uh, issues about current account imbalances, trade imbalances, uh, are very directly related to the need uh, of countries uh, to basically accumulate foreign exchange reserves. And um, so we have a dollar-centered global system. So everyone needs to uh, build up dollars um, to basically self-insure against crisis. Um, and so there are some very fundamental problems uh, that may not obviously relate to uh, the current issues uh, that are being discussed, but, but uh, we need to address them. And uh, second point I want to make is relating to the issue of uh, the kind of elite multilateralism 
uh, that Jose Antonio highlighted, and in particular um, to the IMF stigma. So the IMF is an incredibly important institution, um, but it has a bit of a, a checkered past, uh, to put it positively. <laughs> and um, so there has been uh, mentioning of, of the various emerging market crises of the 1990s, and a very clear lesson from these emerging market crises was that um, we need to do everything for developing emerging countries. Was we need to do everything to avoid such crises from reoccurring, and uh, there was a lot of unhappiness across Latin America, African economies, and of course also the Asian economies, with how the IMF has, men, uh, has handled the crisis. So uh, a lot of countries reached the conclusion we need to self-insure, we cannot rely on the defunct global system, we cannot rely on the IMF. Um, so the uh, implication was that countries have started to try to build up uh, as much foreign exchange reserves as possible. And how you do that? Of course, you have to build up a current account surplus. So that's where uh, part of the issue is with uh, kind of trade imbalances come from. It's not the only reason, uh, but essentially there has been a very, very strong motivation for countries to uh, somehow build their first line of defense. Um, the IMF has changed quite a bit. So uh, you mentioned the, the changing uh, of the IMF's position regarding capital account management. So this is uh, viewed much more favorably in, in Washington now. Um, but for the time being, there is still a very strong feeling that the IMF is essentially an institution dominated by the Europeans and the Americans. And uh, in the 2008-2009 crisis, uh, a lot of people were quite cynical across developing countries, uh, and they noted that, okay, now the advanced countries are, are hit, uh, and the recommendations coming out of Washington are very different. In fact, they were more or less the opposite of, of what Asian countries were told. And I would argue that much of that changed, uh, or change of tone in policy recommendations was linked to some learning effects in Washington. Um, but, but still, there is a, is a genuine mistrust. And uh, so the issue of changing IMF governance is really a very crucial one to, to regain the trust of member countries. And uh, the European dominance at the IMF is very much uh, uh, epitomized by the fact that, of course, always a European and often a French man or French woman uh, has been leading the IMF. And um, there's, of course, a lot of other things that, that need to change, but uh, it would actually be, I think, a very important symbolic change if at some point we get a, a, a leader for the IMF from a developing or emerging country. And this may be wishful thinking, and Jose Antonio has, has pointed out that his struggle to, to uh, take over the World Bank has not been successful, but, um, but I think this is a very symbolic change that is needed, and, and, and uh, hopefully it will come at some point. Um, as a last point, I just want to briefly touch on the role of regional uh, cooperation and regional financial, uh, financial arrangements, which uh, is a bit of a pet topic by uh, both Jose Antonio and myself. So a second lesson from the emerging market crisis and the uh, Asian crisis in particular was that, um, of course, we have to build our first line of defense with domestic reserve accumulation, uh, but also um, that we should try to build up some regional defense mechanisms. And uh, in Asia, uh, even during the Asian crisis, there were attempts to, to develop uh, a regional monetary fund that was shot down at the time. But since then, uh, the so-called Chiang Mai initiative has, has uh, been developed. Uh, it has increased. And um, so it's actually a meaningful vehicle now and uh, as Jose Antonio showed, there's actually now uh, a quite large number of different regional uh, financing arrangements um, of different um, size and roles. But um, this is actually a quite important change in the international monetary landscape. 
Um, the problem right now is that um, only some of these arrangements are really properly working. Yeah? So uh, Jose Antonio mentioned FLAR as a very positive example, a very small one, but a very positive example. Um, but the Chiang Mai Initiative in, in the uh, East Asian region, for example, um, is, is not working properly, partly because it still has a link with IMF lending, so it can only be activated if the IMF is involved, uh, which of course then is again kind of hindered by, by this IMF stigma. Um, but in, in Europe, we have arguably a very powerful regional arrangement now with the uh, European Stability Mechanism, which has a firepower of 500 billion euro, which is much larger than the IMF uh, uh, not long ago. And um, arguably, Europe now having established this one uh, is kind of exiting uh, this IMF system because uh, the past ex experience uh, during the, the Euro crisis uh, with the IMF was not exactly uh, uh, very positive, um, even though one could actually say that uh, partly the unhappiness, for example, from the German side comes from the fact that uh, the IMF was brought in as a kind of tough guy to, to discipline the uh, various problem countries, um, but it was not tough enough, at least for German standards. Um, so the IMF was kind of rather seen as a kind of irritating factor um, in, in between. Um, but arguably now, now the Europeans have established their own mechanism. So, so, um, and, and this opens a, an important question how are we coordinating these different mm. uh, levels? We have kind of the, the domestic, we have the regional, we have the international with the IMF. Um, and it's good to have all these different levels, but it can be very messy because if crises arise, who is responsible for what? You know, um, who is acting uh, at what time? Um, who is kind of what are the financing conditions? Um, because... Uh, not having proper coordination between these institutions can actually make crises even more difficult to resolve and also more costly to resolve. Yeah? So if we have some regional organizations which uh, extend uh, some lifeline to countries that really need to take some tough actions now, uh, then actually things can become even worse. Um, so that is, is, I think, a very crucial uh, area uh, that needs further work. There has been some, some uh, attempts at, at uh, the IMF and regional organizations to address this, but um, I think we need much more progress. And of course, uh, Jose Antonio's book is, again, a very good uh, uh, source of ideas for that. Um, I could go on because there are so many interesting things that, that you brought up, but I will shut up here. Uh, and instead, uh, we'll open the floor uh, we do have some microphones, so, um, uh, hmm? yeah, and um, so uh, we'll take questions, and we'll start with this gentleman, and I'll bring the mic, and, um, and yeah, thank you, and if you could please identify yourself and, and uh, put a short question, yeah, I'll, I'll Uh, George Prendia, yeah. basically I was ex from Random Metropolitan, but um, independent yeah. account. George Prendia, yeah. independent, independent account, uh, consultant, basically in microeconomics. Um, the the question is when Antonio says uh, I am not member of this institution called International Monetary Fund, is this I Antonio or is it I Antonio as a co-director of Bank of Republic Colombia, which I presume is a central bank, or is it I Antonio as a representative? of Colombia as a state, because we, this was supposed to be a discussion about central banking, but central banking has been only mentioned in a passing rather than as a, as a, as a major, should I say, part of the subject. Now, what is the role of central banks in this context? Should they be represented in IMF, or should it be actually representative of the state, democratic, democratically, uh, should I say, uh, elected uh, government. 
So we will be collecting. So. Hi, Danai Kirakapulu, Chief Economist at OMFIV. Thank you very much both for your remarks. Very interesting presentation. I wanted to pick up on your last slides on the global financial safety net and the multi-layer um, architecture that you, you advocated, also building on what Uli was saying about the regional financing arrangements. Um, and if you could expand a little bit on the reasons why you think these should be developed, uh, particularly do you see them as complementary to the IMF or as taking over the IMF? Mm -hmm. uh, and if the latter, is that because of the issues you mentioned about the IMF and the stigma uh, uh, attached to it? What do you think of things like the short-term liquidity swap facility that the M IMF has been debating but has been shot down by Germany and others? Um, and a lot of the shocks that hit different economies tend to be regional. So if we go down the route of these regional financing arrangement, how is that then an issue if, if there are shocks that hit the region as a whole and, and different economies want to access the fund at the same time? Do you not still need a global body that, um, that cancels these out? And then if I may, a question to Stephanie as well on the um, point that you mentioned about this asymmetry between how surplus and um, deficit countries have adjusted, the fact that we have the excessive deficit procedure but not a, sur a surplus equivalent in the euro area. How do you get a country like Germany or the Netherlands that you mentioned uh, adjust when from, a for, from their position in a monetary union, of course it makes sense to address these imbalances, but when you look at their economies in isolation, you have economies like Germany that have aging populations that are very close to full employment. So from a fiscal management perspective, it makes sense for them to build up surpluses. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name's Glenn Hogarth. I'm a Bank of England. Um, I think quite a few people would agree with lots what's been said in terms of the problems. I think, as Stephanie mentioned, the real concern is political will at the moment. So the, the non-system is becoming more of a non-system in the next few years, it looks mm -hmm. like. So I'd be interested to know what you think are the most plausible changes that can be made in the next few years out of your range of suggestions, given the various constraints on current accounts, surplus countries will not adjust, advanced countries will not change their monetary policy, swap lines two years ago were stopped by US and Germany, US has a veto at the IMF, so anything radical at the IMF cannot be changed. So what is it that you think can be changed? Thank you. Okay, let me uh, let me uh, answer, and actually l let me um, uh, reflect actually some of the comments by Stephanie and Ulrich. In the case of Ulrich, I'll, I'll refer also to the to the show the multi-layer architecture, but uh, uh, on which there was one question. Uh, actually, I didn't present uh, the, but in the slide there was this idea of the three basic problems uh, of the global research system. Uh, which is the asymmetric adjustment problem, which was, let's say, Keynes' obsession uh, in his writings before the uh, the IMF negotiations. Uh, so much so that in some uh, previous writings, I call it the anti-Keynesian bias with the system. Uh, uh, so the fact that surplus countries do not adjust, the countries have to adjust. Uh, the, then the second is the Triffin dilemma, which nobody talked about, the, not even in my presentation. Uh, which is the fact that the problem generated by uh, adjustment of, of the major uh, country issue in the global reserve, um, uh, which has, of course, been uh, a very difficult issue at some state, uh, sometimes for the United States with the U.S. dollar. Um, and, and now, for example, talking about a non-system, you know, uh, when uh, you know the major uh, country uh, is running huge uh, uh, fiscal deficits, uh, you know, it's a question mark of, of whether uh, that's, that factor is not uh, generating a, a new instability. Um, uh, and, and finally, the, uh, the inequities of this, uh, which is the self-insurance, the fact that, you know, developing countries in particular, uh, you know, have to accumulate foreign exchange reserves as an insurance, which was a basic lesson of the uh, developing country crisis, uh, notably of the East Asian crisis. Uh, after that, you see a very clear increase in reserves from all developing countries. Okay, so so I think those those are you know important uh, topics. Um, 
uh, and uh, Stephanie said, uh, you know, the uh, the first uh, is certainly a problem of sort of developed countries. Uh, I mean, the symmetric adjustment problem is a certainly uh, a central European problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the way it has been solved is actually, as I show in the graph, by forcing deficit countries to adjust, mm -hmm. uh, which means that the European Union as a group became a huge surplus uh, economy mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, because the, the surplus economies, uh, notably Germany and, and the Netherlands, have not uh, reduced their surpluses, let's say. Now, on the regional cooperation, which um, um, there was this uh, also a question, um, uh, let, let me, uh, you know, should, it be, should all these uh, regional and uh, sub-regional layers be complementary or competitive? Uh, I think l let them be both. <laughs> Um, uh, actually, my, my favorite fund, which is mine, the, the one from my region of the world, the, uh, the Latin American Reserve Fund, has never uh, done anything with the IMF. Uh, so all lending has been done by, by the FLAR, by itself, uh, with no complementary, no program with the IMF. Uh, and I, as, as I point out in the book, and this is widely uh, agreed, uh, the Chiang Mai Agreement has not worked uh, because of that uh, tie with the, mm. uh, with the IMF, that you have be beyond certain level, you have to have an IMF program. Uh, the result uh, of the East Asian crisis, and the boy wants to use the, the Chiang Mai arrangement. Okay? Um, so in, in, in my view, the, you know, let them work uh, any way the regional uh, system wants to, them to work. Uh, that's actually how the, the multilateral development banking system works. Mm. Uh, each institution is on its own. Sometimes it cooperates, sometimes it doesn't cooperate. Uh, actually compete. Competition is good. Uh, so as, as I used to say when I was finance minister, we have the luxury of having three multilateral development banks lent to us. The World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Latin American De uh, Development Bank. So three banks, you know, better than those countries that have only one, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So competition is good. Uh, so this is, uh, so I, I of course, they, they, they sometimes should work as a system. Uh, there has to be some coordination, but for example, I think, and Stefan is right, uh, that the, uh, you know, the IMF played, uh, uh, I mean, the, the fact that in the, in the European adjustment programs that there was a mix of European and, and, and uh, IMF money uh, didn't help. Uh, it was not a good solution, uh, uh, probably on different, uh, for different reasons, for different reasons for the Germans mm -hmm. and different reasons for the adjusting uh, countries. Anyway, so, so I, I, I said the best system is probably not necessarily, not, you don't necessarily tie your programs with the IMF. I think that's the best system. If you want, maybe, but that's your problem. Let each one choose, let's say, um, uh, anyway. Um, uh, let me also, uh, excuse me, on the question of membership, I, I really was talking about the elite multilateralism, I was referring to the G20, and it's my country, of course. I am a Colombian citizen, that's my only citizenship. <laughs> I, ha I have no choice in any other. No, 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 in the G20, uh, actually, well, in, in terms of state, uh, there are the members, right? Uh, and, then, and then there are ministerial meetings uh, today. In the IMF, in my view, it should be the governments, uh, the states. Mm. And the state chooses who represents the country. Uh, so, uh, for example, in, in, my, in, in our case, in Colombia, the central bank is the, uh, the voice in the IMF, but the, uh, and the government is the voice, the Ministry of Finance in the, uh, uh, in, in the World Bank. But it, they, you know, sometimes the Minister of Finance speaks in the IMF, so it's no, no, no uh, strong principle. But you know, in the IMF, in principle, it should be the, the central banks uh, that uh, have the, the the voice. But sometimes are ministers, so it's okay. I mean, I have no problem with. It. Now, what can be done? And and I think out of the of my reforms, for example, there was also a question of the short-term facility. I think the there is a possibility of, of designing a more flexible facility, mm -hmm. uh, a, even a con, you know, flexible contingency facility. Uh, as I said, the, for me, the best model are the swap arrangements. 
Uh, there is a basic mechanism used among developed countries. Uh, so I, I think something that is closer to the swap arrangement uh, is good. But, but by the way, the, uh, the flexible trade line that Colombia uses is a good one, I think. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why other countries refuse to, uh, uh, to apply to it, uh, for it. I think it's a good line. But the, uh, a, a more uh, a short-term facility would be better. A, a stronger use of SDRs is something that is easy to, I think it should be easy to agree, uh, because that's a, that's a mechanism. I, actually, it will solve uh, one of the major problems of the IMF, which is to get money uh, for its lending programs, which is a, a rec recurrent problem with the IMF. Uh, if you use your own way of issuing money as a way of, me of mechanism of financing, you solve that problem. Uh, actually, you, didn't even, you don't even need to have quotas. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, because you, you can actually uh, give them, and the quotas can be the, the money that uh, the IMF issues, the SDRs. So I think that should be um, uh, should be a, a, a easier, a easier mechanism. On the capital account uh, and, and solving the, uh, I, th I think uh, keeping the institutional view uh, is mm. is very important. Uh, and probably the OECD should try to copy the, mm, the institutional exactly. view uh, rather than try to go against the institutional view now that the OECD is discussing uh, uh, this topic again. Uh, uh, and actually, the institutional view, one of the good things that it has, it, uh, you know, at the end, it recommends countries, uh, uh, for example, through bilateral agreements, to have agreements that, that are consistent with the IMF view. Mm. Uh, so that allow you know uh, you know some kind of capital account management under certain circumstances. So I, I think that's also something uh, on debt. I I am a bit. Uh, uh, I don't think there is there are many possibilities to go uh, after the agreement of 2014 uh, uh, that uh, had this uh, enhanced let's say market mechanism. Uh, but uh, and, and finally, I, what, one thing that can be done is actually to keep working on more regional arrangements. Mm. Uh, that's something that uh, is actually uh, uh, will uh, improve the system and, and, and has no negative perspectives, uh, uh, as far as I can see. I mean, the point is that countries in the region have to work on creating the institutions uh, and, and try to make them more op you know, uh, op operative. Yeah, excellent questions. Um, I think the first one was about Germany, how you can convince a prosperous Germany uh, with quite full employment to have an expansion. I think that's a really difficult but very important question. I mean, if you look at carefully at, uh, you know, infrastructure in Germany, like digital infrastructure, you know, when you try and use the internet in Germany, it's not very good. So there is a quite a large infrastructure deficit in Germany. And some people have low wages. I mean, overall, the standard of living is quite high, but there is quite a big group of people who have low wages. So you could build a case um, if you change the sort of mindset that Germany would actually prosper from uh, having a more expansionary policy, both in terms of public investment, which is actually negative if, once you take depreciation out, and uh, higher incomes. So that would increase welfare for Germans, but it would also expand uh, aggregate demand in, in deficit countries. You know, if you increase the wages of a German worker and they go for a longer holiday in Greece, you know, it's a it's a win-win, to put it simply. Um, and I would love to join them. Um, <laughs> now, in, in it's also a very interesting but difficult question of what is most feasible. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that Jose Antonio mentioned, uh, and this is perhaps more important in the case of development banks rather than, I, than liquidity facility provision, is the creation by the South, or uh, particularly by China-led institutions, of parallel institutions. Um, and, and the case of the crea massive creation of the AIIB with $100 billion of capital involving the developed countries, but dominated basically by the emerging economies, and especially China, has actually catalyzed quite a lot of change, I think, in the World Bank. I mean, the World Bank suddenly discovered they had to do more on infrastructure, 
which had been kind of refusing to do, and which was one of the reasons, I think, why the Chinese and others created this institution. So I think having precisely this more decentralized financial system, having more uh, countries from the South uh, taking a role, uh, having this kind of competition, as Jose Antonio says, is, is, I think, healthy because it will also push the more developed countries to make bigger efforts through institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and, uh, and in fact, they may, you know, for example, if, if the World Bank and the IMF had done more, and if they had given more voice in the boards of the institutions to developing countries, maybe the Chinese wouldn't have even done this AIIB. So I think it's in the interest of developed countries to, to, to do more, to change the voice, to show that these institutions are more flexible so that you have a more collaborative approach. I agree that SDRs should be actually easy technically to issue. And politically, it, it wouldn't really harm anybody. Uh, it's not really inflationary, as the Germans say. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think would be good is to have larger IMF facilities and more flexible, particularly for the poor countries. I mean, the poor countries don't have hardly any condition, low conditional automatic facility. If they're hit by terms of trade shock, if the price of their main commodity falls or the price of oil, if they import oil goes up, you know, they have to have this very painful adjustment. But in the past, actually, um, the IMF had a very good facility, the compensatory financing facility. Every time I proposed they should expand it, they would diminish it. Every time I wrote papers saying that they should lower the conditionality, they increased it. So I'm not a very good prophet. But I think, I, I think you know, if you care for really poor people, this is a very good way of, of protecting poor people in, in, in poor countries uh, to, to these external shocks. Yeah, well, we have a couple of questions, and I'd like to, so you go first, and, and could you put it very briefly, please? Thank you. Um, I want to ask uh, for both of you, uh, Professor Stephanie and Professor Jose Antonio, um, you call for more regulation of cross-border capital flows. Uh, so what can be done in terms of to manage this like growth of uh, shadow banking, and in, in your perspective, um, what could be the consequences of the growth of shadow banking in the developing world? And secondly, uh, if you can provide us your thoughts about the international, uh, sorry, the, monetary, the Argentina monetary crisis and the the role of the IF, the International Monetary Fund, um, when you call for eliminate the stigma of of the fund, and we can see that there are kind of uh, uh, proposals for more austerity there. Thank you. One question per person. You next. Uh, many thanks for this session. So my question is, what is the bottom line effect of the American-China trade war for the international financial system for both developed and developing countries? Thanks. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's already, you know, common thread in many discussions. Uh, much good from Thomas. Um, my question is uh, how to get to overcome this non system of counterfeit. How to get out from this non system mm -hmm. called non system <coughs> of uh, sort of counter cyclical liquidity management at global level at the moment in the end who who has a render of last resort it's because of system US dollar centered judicial system I mean basically it is Federal Reserve which has seems to be liquidity is in the end related to US monetary policy and you mentioned and your book mentioned that more active use of SDR is a very important source and you know it doesn't depend on individual countries willingness to uh, put the liquidity into system uh, what is, is it technical 
problem still there, or it's political question completely, and uh, whether you know regional route will really solve that sort of problem, or it had to be change at global level in such a way that counter-cyclical liquidity management is done much uh, better way to not push countries to thank, individual. Thank you very much. And the very final question, very, very brief, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ali. I'm regular here, but uh, this is the third one I attend on economics and, and finance. Uh, my question which becomes more or less uh, stand in order, is about the disparity of the uh, exchange rates vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar of, of the world. I'm mainly Mesopotamia by virtue of my origins, that the Iraqi dinar has devalued 4,000-fold times. So you multiply that by 100 and you get uh, the answer. Uh, and in the question of Zimbabwe one, I was even more surprised that uh, their rate has uh, devalued by hundreds of thousands uh, towards millions. Uh, I couldn't believe that. I haven't been convinced by economists why this is so, why we can't uh, delete these, some of these zeros, as Turkey did several years ago. Uh, so now a dollar instead of six uh, Turkish leaders uh, would have been yeah. six uh, can million you, can, you, can you ask your question, please? That is the question. Why the disparity in the exchange rates, uh, ridiculous one, of these countries? We st Zimbabwe still has gold and precious metals. We still have in Mesopotamia black gold and other resources. Why is this disparity convince me? This is the third one. Uh, as economist, uh, I don't know, I don't understand economics or what, but why should it be from a dinar used to be more than okay. three dollars, now a dollar is a thousand two hundred or so uh, dinars, yeah. please. Thank you. So we do have a bit of a time problem because it's four o'clock now, so the so rhetoric is over, but there's no one waiting outside, so... We, we will have a few minutes, but really only a few minutes, to, to give uh, for, for San Antonio and also Stephanie to give a few uh, final remarks. And you get two minutes each. <laughs> that's challenging. <laughs> no, on, on two questions, I would say that's, those are domestic problems. Uh, the issue of shadow banking. Shadow banking is a domestic uh, regulatory problem. I mean, uh, I don't think the international community should, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, should, of course, support countries to eliminate shadow banking. Uh, but that's a domestic reality. And the exchange rate issue, does the, I mean, all the cases that you mentioned are major domestic imbalances. Uh, so you have to eliminate domestic imbalances. And you have hyperinflation, uh, which is the case of Zimbabwe, let's say, or, mm. or now Venezuela in my region. Uh, you know, that's a domestic problem. We, you know, the international community should, of course, support uh, the stabilization of those countries, but that's, uh, that's about the, that. The, the China-U.S. Uh, trade war, um, uh, I mean, I think the major international effect on, on the issue that we're talking about is the, the uh, depreciation of the, of the renminbi uh, that it uh, has generated, uh, which is, uh, of course, now uh, looked at by the U.S. as a pos potential uh, unfair competition. Uh, anyway, so the um, now the uh, on um, on Machiko questions are actually on the issue of what to do. I mean, go, going back to that issue, um, uh, let me let me really say that uh, my perspective in this book is 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 uh, is as I call it evolutionary. Mm. Uh, so try to see how you improve things, uh, and probably piece by piece. I'm not sure, uh, let's say, a second Bretto Woods uh, is possible, but uh, uh, it will be very difficult. But you can actually discuss issue by issue and try to improve that. Uh, and I mentioned several cases. I mean, in capital account, in, uh, in, um, a, in let's say, in building uh, re regional institutions, etc. Uh, and also in the, um, let's say, uh, in this lender of last resort, uh, which is quasi-lender of last resort, 
role of the IMF. Uh, and I think, uh, again, uh, uh, building uh, uh, better facilities, more automatic uh, facilities, something, again, closer to the swap arrangements uh, mm -hmm. is probably the way to go. Uh, uh, it works uh, well among developed countries. Uh, in developing countries, it will not work because uh, we, we have no reserve currencies. Uh, but you know, if you de de develop lines in the IMF which are work a bit more flexibly uh, uh, and automatically, uh, I think that will be make this. And how do you finance them with the SDRs? That's my proposal. Um, very quickly. Uh, on shadow banking and the need to regulate it. I think that it, it starts as a domestic uh, um, problem, as Jose Antonio says, but it also spreads internationally because you have, for example, all these non-deliverable forwards where hedge funds and banks take positions on the exchange rate of emerging economies. And of course, they can regulate it, and countries like South Korea have done it. I don't know how successfully, but they have, they have tried. But I think a certain international coordination of the regulation of shadow banking is very important. There's a group of uh, quite radical academics who have signed a letter recently actually accusing the World Bank of encouraging shadow banking in developing countries. Because they say that the World Bank, in this thing of involving the private sector, which on the whole I think is, is, is a good thing, but they're doing it in a way to precisely encourage all these very speculative mechanisms and all these complicated leverage institutions, and that instead of actually regulating shadow banking, they're encouraging it. It, it seems a bit exaggerated, but I think there is, there is some, some truth in it. Um, and finally, on this US trade problem, position, I think that the problem is that um, the measures being taken by the, by, by the Trump administration in particular pose a lot of risks to the international financial system because we already have all these financial vulnerabilities, you know, too much corporate debt, too much debt in China and so on. But all this can be accentuated as, as, as happened in the 30s by, by a growth of protectionism if, if it spreads. I mean, luckily it's not spread so much, but if the conflict becomes very, very big, I think it can be, uh, you know, it, it could be a potential risk of a trigger for an international uh, financial crisis. And a particular danger, which I, I, I think Trump hasn't even thought about, um, it's, it's a sort of nuclear weapon, so I'm not sure the Chinese would do it, but I mean, they hold a lot of US Treasury bills. Yeah? So if, if they're really pushed into a corner by, by the Americans on trade, you know, they could. They could sell U.S. Treasury bills. It's not in their interest because that would lower the price of U.S. Treasury bills. But but it is something which shows you again the many connections of, between finance and trade, and so it's actually a very kind of negative uh, world of, of doing that, rather than uh, you know improving the trade system and and more fundamentally uh, reforming the the international financial system. Thank you, Stephanie. It's still a rather gloomy ending. Um, no. And <laughs> no, no, no. But, so uh, as a scholar, I can say one thing that, that, in a way, dealing with these problems is, is in a way, nice for me or for us. Uh, we'll never run out of problems to deal with, because um, these problems are not, not, not going to be... be, be <laughs> yeah. Not going to be solved anytime soon, but uh, but I think to go back to the point I made earlier on, I think um, Jose Antonio has not only shown uh, a lot of the problems or highlighted a lot of the problems, but also um, addressed a lot of very sensible uh, potential solutions. And uh, I think we're all aware that you know we're not going to see the big overhaul of the international monetary system anytime soon. Um, but there are certainly a lot of areas where we need to keep pushing and, and uh, scholars need to provide uh, good workable ideas. Um, and of course, policymakers have to see what they can, can implement. Um, and so it's very encouraging to have uh, a policymaker like you who is very much thinking about these issues. And uh, I'd like to thank you and also Stephanie very, very much for joining us today and uh, giving these wonderful 
uh, thought, sharing them with us. Uh, thank you, and uh, let's and all... You. You. Uh, I don't thank myself. <laughs> um, no, we thank you. <laughs> so, so let's give a hand to our wonderful speakers.